Hey everybody, welcome to Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain. Welcome to the show. We've got a great, uh, a great lineup for you tonight. We're going to be talking about mold toxicity. Really, we're going to be talking about those of you who have maybe changed your diet, gone gluten-free, um, and even grain-free, done it properly, and you still continue to struggle um, with, with your health. In essence, you've made the right diet changes, you've made the right lifestyle changes, but continue to struggle. Because one of the biggest issues that, that I see clinically and, um, and that is very, very common is actually mold toxicity. So I wanted to do a deep dive or a deeper dive into mold. And this is part one of a multi-part series tonight. So we're going to talk all about mold toxicity. We're going to dive into symptoms tonight. We're going to dive into how mold can affect you in which different ways and certain lab tests that you can run both on yourself and also on your home to help you get a better understanding of whether or not mold is playing a major role in your problem. So um, stick with me all the way through if you are gluten-free and still struggling at all. So let's dive right into mold toxicity. Well, so one of the things that helps us identify whether mold is a problem, aside from a failed grain-free diet or gluten-free diet, is different types of tests. You know, I have a, I live by a credo within, within my practice, which is tests don't guess, because so many doctors guess, or so many doctors will, will gaslight you, right? You'll go in. It's crazy how much I see this. A patient goes into the doctor's office. They, you know, they list out this plethora of different symptoms and problems that they're having. The doctor can't figure it out. So in essence, instead of diving deep and, and doing some testing and, and actually believing their patients, they gaslight them. They say, oh, it's in your head. You're just stressed out. And they send them off to the psychiatrist for some antidepressants uh, or blame everything on depression or blame everything on stress. And this is very, very common, especially in the mold world, because if you're in mold, you are chronically sick and no matter what you do, no matter how you try to supplement, no matter how you change your diet, no matter how you try to exercise or do the right things, you just can't make a recovery. So there's some specific types of tests that can be done to help you to determine um, whether or not you have a mold issue. And so let's talk about some testing for you, right, for yourself. And one of these tests is to look at mycotoxin levels. Now, what is a mycotoxin? Mold produces these chemicals, if you will, these volatile organic compounds. They're byproducts of mold and they're called mycotoxins. And there are different types of mycotoxins. There are toxins that are produced by different strains or different species of mold. So for example, we've got black mold produces a type or a family of mold toxins called trichothecenes. Then we also have aspergillus and penicillium molds that produce things like acrotoxin and aflatoxin. There, there are, again, there are a number of different families of mold toxins and these can be tested for. Now this type of testing medically is relatively new. It's, 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 it's about as new as 20 years old, meaning it hasn't been around for a super long period of time. So a lot of doctors aren't aware. Um, they're just not aware how to do it. They're not aware that it can be done. Right, and this is one of the most critical, the most important tests if you suspect mold. And the reason why, if you have mycotoxins in your body and it can be measured being excreted from your body, then we actually can confirm beyond the shadow of a doubt that you do have mold exposure. Now, whether that mold exposure is coming from your house or whether that mold exposure is coming from foods because certain foods can also um, contain mycotoxins as well. As a matter of fact, in farming, the industry itself, mycotoxic kosis in animals is a common problem. And there are a lot of, of uh, nutritional technologies that are implemented in farming to try to remove mycotoxins from foods. But you can eat mycotoxins in moldy types of foods you can also be exposed to a water damaged building and it doesn't even necessarily have to have been water damaged. It could be improper construction. There are a number of things that happen during construction that can lead to a breach of the moisture barriers or the vapor barriers around your home and that can lead to mold growth as well. So mycotoxin testing tells you beyond the shadow of a doubt that you're being exposed to mold in high enough quantities to register high levels of toxins coming out of you. So this is, in my opinion, one of the most important tests to ask your doctor to measure. 
Then we also have tests that can measure yeast overgrowth. Now, let's, let's talk about the difference between mold and mold toxins versus a yeast overgrowth. Whereas yeast overgrowth is when the mold grows in you, inside of you. The common example uh, of this is candida. If you ever heard of candida, the candida is a type of yeast or mold. Candida albicans, one of the most common discussed. I've discussed it a number of times in its relationship to gluten because this particular species of mold has been shown to mimic, uh, to make proteins that mimic gluten. And so we know that people with chronic candidiasis or candida overgrowth act very, very similarly to somebody who's getting gluten exposure when they're gluten sensitive. So we know candida can grow in you and this can be measured as well. How do you measure it? You can measure it uh, by looking at your microbiome. There are specific types of technologies that can measure microbiome. And you can also measure candida antibodies. There are a number of different um, antibody tests that you can have your doctor measure that can help you understand whether or not you have candida happening in you as well. So, so yeast overgrowth, again, most typically occurs in the mouth, in the GI tract, and ladies in the, in the vaginal canal, those are the three primary areas where we'll see yeast overgrowth. Sometimes um, we'll see it further up. So, so mouth, I said, and GI tract. GI tract, including the esophagus. As a matter of fact, candidiasis is a very, very common cause of esophageal inflammation. So if you've had a, a scope done and the docs are saying, yeah, you've got some inflammation in your esophagus and in your stomach, we don't know why, there's no discernible reason. Think candida or candidiasis and ask for antibody testing because that might be the thing that helps you understand it. Now, yeast overgrowth in your body is not the same thing as mold growing in your home. There, there are different types of mold and there are different types of, um, of problems altogether, but I just want you to understand yeast overgrowth in the body oftentimes occurs as a result of mycotoxicosis or mycotoxin exposure, meaning that when mycotoxins, uh, when you're exposed to heavy quantities of them, one of the side effects is immune suppression. And when you have immune suppression, what happens is mold is opportunist, right? Candida is an opportunist. We all have some degrees of mold in us, candida inside of us, but when we have immunosuppression, that candida, that small amount, can grow out of control and become a very, very large amount. And, and so again, we call it an opportunist. And when that immune system is suppressed, we have the opportunity for mold to begin growing more aggressively inside of us. And this is very, very common to see this happen. Now we'll also see yeast overgrowth happening on the skin. It can manifest as eczema. We'll see yeast overgrowth in the nail beds, you know, yellow discoloration under the nail beds, whether it be the fingers or the toes. Those are opportunistic infections caused by immune suppression because healthy immune systems generally fight mold from overgrowing. But yeast overgrowth is a symptom of the potential for environmental mold exposure causing immune suppression in you. And then there's also testing that can be done for mold allergies. And that, that brings me to a point I want to address because a lot, again, what you'll hear a lot, I get this all the time from, from immunologists and allergists. So if you go see a doctor and they're an immunologist slash allergist, um, a lot of times they'll tell you, they'll do a skin prick test for molds and they'll tell you, here's some Benadryl or here's some Zyrtec or here's some Allegra or whatever. Here's an anti, here's an immune suppressing medicine to stop you from having the symptoms of the immune response from the thing that you're allergic to. And they'll tell you that mold, beyond being allergic to mold, mold is not typically a problem. And I get so sick of hearing this from the, from the doctors that are supposed to be the experts in immunology, and they're, oftentimes they're just not. That's not to say there aren't good ones out there, but I get this a lot, is that mold is only a problem if you're allergic to it. Okay, the same thing, it's the same scenario with gluten, right? Gluten is only a problem if you have celiac disease. And we know that's not true, right? Because celiac is just one of many manifestations of gluten-induced autoimmune inflammation. Well, it's the same thing with mold. An allergic reaction to mold is possible. So, so this, you can be allergic to mold. We'll put a check by that. But you can also have a overgrowth, as I was talking about earlier, an overgrowth, an opportunistic overgrowth, 
or some doctors will, will call it infection, this can also be true. And this can also cause a list of symptoms and problems of its own. You can also be reacting to the mycotoxins directly. And that, again, that's why we can measure mycotoxins. That's why it's so important to measure them because when you react to mycotoxins, the list of symptoms is quite long and it's not the same as allergy. And as we'll talk about tonight, there are a number of different things that when you have this trifecta, right? When you're allergic to mold, but you also have an overgrowth of different types of fungus and you also have external mold growing in your home creating mycotoxins that you're inhaling that you're absorbing through your skin and your mucous membranes you know this trifecta is the most dangerous now what I sometimes see is some people are just allergic to mold and they're not living in mold but when they are exposed to higher quantities of mold they struggle their immune system struggles this is kind of the best case scenario right the the overgrowth or the yeast overgrowth candidiasis that that's not the best scenario because these can be tough to deal with. These are oftentimes very challenging to get rid of. And then there's mycotoxicosis or mycotoxin levels. This is almost always, almost always, not always, but almost always environmental. That means either you're living in it or you're working in it. And so, I, you know, or you're driving in it because your car can be, you know, your car could have mold growing in its air ducts and everything else. So living, working, or driving are common areas where we'll see people get the environmental exposure. Now, the other thing I commonly hear is that, look, everybody is exposed to mold. Mold is everywhere. Yes, mold is everywhere. I've heard that be said, and, and I'm sure you have if you have had that conversation with your doctor. Mold is everywhere. But when you concentrate mold into the box of your house, right? And you've got all those mycotoxins inside your home. It's a, it's a higher concentration gradient than it is if you were to have the same amount outside because outside you've got trillions of tons of cubic airspace in your home. You've got a finite closed area. And if you've got mold self auto perpetuating mycotoxins on a regular basis, this concentrates and concentrates and recirculates through your home and through your body. And so just because mold is everywhere outside doesn't mean that having mold in your house is this harmless thing. I, I get this a lot even with mold inspectors. They'll come out and they'll do certain types of tests and they'll try to they'll try to tell you, you know, you don't have much of a mold problem because they can't see it. Right, and that's, a, that's another hallmark, that's another major issue. So um, again, coming back to mold can affect you in a way where you can be allergic to it, where you can be exposed or poisoned by the mycotoxins, but also where you have mold that can grow or overgrow inside of you. Now, if you're not sure whether this is coming from food or whether it's coming from potentially your home, there are a couple of different things that you should have done, and one is, you can do, this is a screening test. It's called an ERMI. And, it, and it, I say it's a screening test because it's not definitive. Um, an ERMI, that stands for Environmental Relativity Mold Index. And this is, this is a dust swab in the house where they do a PCR, a polymerase chain reaction, measuring quantities of mold spores per gram of dust that you collect. And so this can oftentimes be an indicator that you have a problem. So an ERMI is a lot more of a, it's a lot less expensive to do an ERMI than it is to hire a mold inspector to come out. The ERMI test costs a couple hundred dollars. A mold inspector, you generally you're starting in the realm of at least that amount. So a mold investigator. Now, my advice, if you suspect you've got mold in the home, the worst thing you could possibly do is hire a mold inspector who comes out, charges you $500 and they run an air test Actually, they run two air tests usually, sometimes a little bit more, but they'll run one, an air test in your home, and then they'll also run an air test outside, and they call that the control. So they're comparing the quantity of mold in the house from an air test versus the quantity of mold circulating outside. So going back to what I said a minute ago, which it's about all about the concentration gradient, you can measure the same amount of mold um, or mycoto mycotoxin floating around outside as you can in your house. That doesn't mean that in living in your house is safe because it's the same amount outside. Remember, it's about the concentration gradient. The more you're getting exposed to in higher concentrations over time. 
So again, the worst thing you can do is hire an investigator to come out and do an air test. Like if this is all they're doing, don't spend the money. It's a waste of time. Now, a lot of people struggle to find a good mold inspector. And so one of the things that I would encourage you all, if you suspect mold, is don't just call, don't just open the yellow pages and try to find a mold, uh, mold inspector or, or um, don't call your realtor and look for a mold inspector. The industry is, is, is just like the medical industry. It's full of people who are inadequate at their jobs and they wanna come out and do a quick test and make a quick buck. And they don't really care one way or the other oftentimes whether you do or don't have mold. They're just really, they're in it for the volume of the money that they're producing. Now again, I, I don't wanna demonize all mold investigators, but this is a very, very common trend that I've seen in 21 years of practice. So how do you find one that's good? You contact a mold litigation attorney. Why do you contact a mold litigation attorney? You get a referral from a mold litigation attorney. Not that you're taking anybody to court per se, but the, the thing with mold litigation attorneys, they know the best mold inspectors. And here's why. They have to be very, very sure when they take a, a builder or they take a, a landlord to court in an attempt to prove that mold is poisoning their client, they have to have all the best evidence. They have to have the imaging, you know, they have to have the PCR testing, the, the mycotoxin testing, the mold testing. So they don't rely on this air test uh, or on that mold inspector who's just simply doing an air test. So call that mold litigation attorney and find out who is the person that you would recommend that I use um, as if I were preparing for a court battle because that's the inspector that's gonna come out and do a good job. Some of the tools that, uh, that a good mold inspector will come out with, they'll come out with, yes, they will have an air test, but they'll also have an infrared camera, they'll have a fiber optic camera they can run behind your walls. A good mold investigator might have a smoke machine where they can measure airflow through your walls to see whether or not you have uh, vapor barrier problems from your attic where moisture and, and uh, outdoor mold spores are, are bleeding through into your wall cavities because that's a common way that mold can grow behind your walls where you don't see it. So air testing in that way or, or smoke testing, airflow testing is it can be a very important tool. So you want to make sure that that mold inspector also has things like uh, like moisture readers and knows how to use them. Um, ideally, that mold inspector should um, get a thorough history of your home, meaning not just come over and say, oh, yeah, I'm going to run an air test real quick, but they should talk to you about any of the potential for pipe bursts or leaks or roof leaks or any history about your home that might indicate that there is a, a potential for mold to be growing, especially in a particular place. They also will do a very thorough eval eval evaluation of your, of your HVAC system to make sure there's not mold growing inside of your AC ducts. This is the common thing that we'll see people that turn on their AC ducts after the winter um, or turn on their heater at the beginning of, of winter uh, where, where all that air is stirring up and blowing and they've got mold growing in their ductwork, that really can cause a major exacerbation. So again, they should be doing all those things. They should be doing an investigation, not a test, not a simple test, but an investigation. Okay, and so don't, it, it, you don't spend the money if they're not gonna do their job and do the right work. So let's move into some of the symptoms of mold toxicity. There, there are a number of them and I've, I've just selected this is not, by all means, this is not a comprehensive list, but these are some of the big ones that we, that we see. Chronic sinusitis. So if you chronically have inflamed or impacted sinuses where you have trouble breathing, you, uh, a lot of times we'll see people with sleep apnea as a result of, of the chronic sinusitis or recurring infections. And so a lot of times what happens with chronic sinusitis is doctors give antibiotics. What's interesting about this is most people with chronic sinusitis, this is a mold issue. This is a, a mold problem. There's actually a study published, I think it was Journal of American Medical Association, it was a, about 15, 20 years ago. They did a major study on the people with chronic sinusitis and what they found is the vast majority of them did not have a bacterial infection but they had mold growing in their sinus cavities. And so if you take an antibiotic to treat what a doctor's calling an upper respiratory infection, but it's not being caused by bacteria, but being caused by mold, then you actually worsen the mold problem, right? Because antibiotics knock out your good flora. They don't just knock out, you know, potential bad flora. They knock out good guys. 
And so when you knock out healthy microbial flora, you make more room, you create more growth potential for mold to go out of control. So chronic antibiotics actually make a mold problem worse. This is why it's so critical to not just take an antibiotic for any old reason, right? I think the doctors hand them out like candy, but you know there is a consequence to chronic antibiotic use, and one of them is chronic mold exposure or chronic mold overgrowth. It's one of the quickest ways to get there. We see muscle and joint pain. This is a very, very common symptom. One study, um, one study recently done found that 51% of people exposed to water damage molds, um, water damage building molds, had joint pain compared to people who weren't being exposed. Crushing fatigue. You could sleep 12 hours. You could sleep 15 hours. You wake up exhausted. Um, this is actually what happened to me. I was in I was in in uh, in black mold. We had hundreds of thousands of black mold spores growing in the walls of our home. And one of the things that was happening to me was I I'm, you know I, I'm an early riser. I like to usually I like to get up at least 5 a.m. Um, but I wasn't able to get up. I was I was barely peeling myself off the pillow at 7:30 8 o'clock to get my day going. So this severe fatigue, no matter what you do, no matter what supplements you take, no matter how much you sleep, if you're suffering with crushing fatigue and you don't have anemia, remember mold is a major, major cause of this. Sleep issues, trouble going to sleep is another major problem. There are some chemicals that, that mycotoxins cause you to produce in your immune system that actually activate the brain and can keep you awake and stop you from going to sleep. These, a lot of these are inflammatory. If you've heard there's a there's this term sears which many of you may have heard of if you've been researching mold at all it stands for chronic inflammatory response syndrome and it's oftentimes caused as a result of chronic mold exposure neurological symptoms so migraine headaches and so migraine is a neurological problem but you'll also see with migraines tremendous brain fog what happens to people in mold is they almost develop like an alzheimer's style or dementia style of illness. I've seen, uh, I've seen pe people come to see me where they, their dementia was so severe. I've seen wives not, not recognize their husbands as a result of mold exposure. Um, I've seen cases where I had to finish the sentence, every other sentence, because the person was just so struggling to try to find the right word because they couldn't pull it from their brain. They couldn't get it from their, from their brain to their lips to their tongue. And so that heavy, heavy brain fog where you don't remember things well, but you also can't focus, you can't concentrate, you have word recall problems, all part of the neurological consequences of mold, which we now know there's actually, there was a federal court case um, done. This was actually a number of years ago, but, but a woman by the name of Shelley Frederico, um, she basically proved in a federal court battle that mold could cause damage to the brain using three-dimensional MRI technology called NeuroQuant. So this is just one of the other types of tests that can be done that helps you to understand how mold may be impacting you neurologically through, uh, through damaging your brain directly. We know severe mood swings irritability as well can occur and this, you know, just like with anything else that affects you and makes you feel bad, mood swings can come with that. We know hormone disruption. Some mycotoxins mimic estrogen. There's one in particular. called xerolenone, and that particular mycotoxin is an estrogen mimicker, so it can create, in men, it can create apathy and depression, in women, it can create estrogen dominance types of symptoms, and because, again, it's, it's a pseudo, it's, it's not technically an estrogen, but it, because it mimics estrogen, it can bind to estrogen receptors, creating an estrogen imbalance. We know mold causes immune dysfunction, and, and particularly depression, so it reduces immune function, leading to a whole sequelae of different types of problems, a, a sequelae of different types of immune reactions. A lot of you here, I, I'll point this out, if you've been told you have mast cell activation problems, MCAS, right, Ac and mast cell activation syndrome, MCAS, this is actually a major hallmark of mold exposure. I get this all the time. As people come to me, they've been diagnosed with mast cell disease, and they don't really have mast cell disease. What they actually have is mold problems. And when we take care of the mold problems, the mast cell activation stops 
right? And so they can get a semblance of normalcy again by dealing with the environmental poison they were being exposed to. But it's been very well documented. We actually know that mycotoxins, mold exposure can trigger mast cells from uh, trigger them to degranulate on a, on a hyper intense basis, leading to the symptoms of mast cell activation. Chronic sugar cravings. If you're chronically looking for seeking out sugar, this is a very common problem uh, associated with particularly with the candidiasis. So the yeast overgrowth, right? Yeast will, will create massive craving for, for carbohydrate sugars. Uh, and they'll hijack, literally, they'll hijack, neurologically, they'll hijack your brain and make you want to eat sugar. This is where some of you may be trying to cut back on sugar and you just feel like it's such an overwhelming craving and you buckle. This could possibly be, again, a yeast issue. I mentioned apathy and depression before, both symptoms. These are, again, part of the neurological component, but also part of the hormone component to how mold can impact you. Skin rashes, very, very common to see eczema as a result of chronic mold exposure. And then mold growing in the nail beds, and I'll show you a better picture even than that. This is, um, this is from an actual uh, client of mine who came in. You can see here, you can see the yellow discoloration within the nail beds themselves, and you can see the frayed edges. Uh, this is mold growing underneath the nail bed, so you can also see it here, all right, that dryness growing into, into the toes. And then you can see here in the nail beds, this white discoloration, like at the tip of the nail, that's mold growing underneath that nail. You can see it through all of the nail beds. And so when, when you find out where that's coming from, where the environmental source of mold or candidiasis is coming from, oftentimes it, it effectively goes away. Now, a lot of people with these findings have autoimmune diseases and they're being treated with immunosuppressing medications, the, the um, disease-modifying anti-rheumatics, or sometimes in some cases, they're on the biologic medications which suppress the immune system. Remember what I said about yeast earlier? Yeast overgrowth is a consequence of immune system suppression. These are opportunistic yeasts and they start growing on you when you don't have a strong enough immune system to support yourself. So if, you're, if you've been healthy your whole life and all of a sudden you start getting fungal toenail infections or finger toenail or finger fungal infections, you need to suspect that there may be mold either growing in you, creating a problem, or that there's mold growing outside of you externally. I actually, this is one of the symptoms I had. I didn't have it to this extent, but in my big toe, one of my big toes, I started to get yellow discoloration mold growth underneath. I was like, I'm a healthy guy. Why is this happening to me? It was one of my first clue ends that I was actually in a moldy environment. So again, if that's happening to you, the likelihood that you've got a mold problem is 100%. Now, let's look at kind of some of the, some of the, the things that happen, right? To kind of give you a visual of what, of what can happen with chronic mold and mycotoxin exposure. So one of the things that happens with exposure so again, you, remember I said earlier, with the mold, you could be allergic to mold, okay? You could have an overgrowth of mold, or you could be being poisoned by mycotoxins. They're different. Each one of these things is a different thing, and this is why... This is why so many people don't get it figured out, and so many doctors kind of unfortunately mislabel folks. They stop here. Again, your immunologists, your allergists are generally going to do a skin prick test to look at allergy. And if you don't have that, they completely dismiss mold as a, as a potential issue. But when you're exposed to mold and mycotoxins, it obviously it's going to create inflammation, right? I mean, that, that exposure is going to create an inflammatory process. But it's important to understand mycotoxins particularly they inhibit your ability to form new DNA and new RNA. And actually, that's not all. They also inhibit protein synthesis. So this has been very well researched and very well established. So we, we know that when you can't make protein very efficiently and when you're not making DNA and RNA effectively, guess what happens? You lower your capacity to heal and repair. Your body heals and repairs every day. You go to bed at night so that you can heal and repair. 
right? That's part of what sleep is all about. But if your DNA and RNA and your protein synthesis is being inhibited, how effective do you think you're going to heal or repair from the day before, right? Now multiply that over six months, 12 months, five years, 10 years, you've got major, major problems. You're not healing, you're not repairing. So this inhibition leads to a lot of major problems. And one of the problems associated with the exposure is cancer. There are several forms of cancer that have been linked to mold, chronic mold toxicity and mold exposure. Um, and part of the reason why, again, when you can't repair, uh, when you can't repair, the cells start to change. They become abnormal and they develop into a, a cancerous line of cells and that can really impact you. Um, follow the line up, right? You see, when these things happen, the other thing that happens is a weakened immune system. So this is especially true of mycotoxins. What are mycotoxins? Mycotoxins are metabolites. They're, they're secondary intermediary metabolites that mold produces. And why? Why would mold want to produce a mycotoxin? Because mycotoxins, when they go out into the world, they suppress life of other life forms. It's part of the job. That's part of how mold can replicate and grow and get stronger is it suppresses other life forms in its area. It uses mycotoxins as a, as a vehicle to suppress other bacteria, to suppress other life forms so that it can get a foothold and grow and replicate and become stronger. And so if you just happen to be that life form, right, those mycotoxins, you're going to experience the weakened immune system that can come from that. Now understand that mycotoxins are roughly 0.2 microns in size. This is tiny. You can absorb them through your skin. So you could be fully clothed. That's why when you see people going to clean up mold, uh, mold damaged buildings, they're wearing Tyvek suits, right? These full on, it looks what looks to be like a chemical warfare gear, right? They're wearing these full suits and full respirator masks. Why? Because they're protecting their skin, the surface of their skin from this absorbing through their skin because it can go right through your skin and it can get into you. It can get through your eyes, it can get into your nose, to, into your lungs when you breathe. And so that's why the respirator and that's why the Tyvek suits, very, very small. But they weaken the immune system through the inhibition of DNA and RNA, right? And when, a weak, when an immune system is weaker, one of the things that you're more susceptible to developing is bacterial and fungal infections. So both, both can be true. And this is what we'll see clinically is a lot of people will develop gram negative types of bacteria they'll have they'll have a plethora of gram negative bacteria producing toxins remember some of these gram negative bacteria produce what are called lps lipopolysaccharides these are chemical toxins produced by these bacteria that can damage the liver and they're also linked to leaky gut so a lot of people say dr osborne how do i heal leaky gut i'm doing everything right my diet's right if you've got persistent leaky gut and liver damage and problems that won't go away even though you've changed your diet and your lifestyle, you've got to start looking toward the environment as the potential and the environment of, of the potential for mold or mold problems. Yeast overgrowth. Again, I was talking earlier about this, right, in that you know, secondary uh, overgrowth of yeast is a result of the opportunity that the yeast have. They take advantage of your weakened immune system and they get a foothold. And so what happens a lot of times when you see you know bacterial infections you get an antibiotic typically but yeast infections you also get an antibiotic because doctors don't do cultures these days they don't they don't do their their diligence and so they just write the antibiotic and guess what the antibiotic then disrupts your microbiome right and that further weakens and disrupts your ability to protect yourself remember your microbiome you're outnumbered 10 to 1 by these these life forms that live inside of, of your gi tract and what do they do they help help you digest your food, they help you make vitamins, they help seal your gut by producing a substance called mucin, but also importantly, they regu they're regulators of your immune response. And so if you have a disrupted microbiome, microbiome from chronic antibiotic use, but also from mycotoxin poisoning, right? Because mycotoxins can also disrupt your microbiome, right? So it's like a double hit, the mycotoxin creating the immune suppression, creating the yeast overgrowth that's treated improperly you further get disruption, you further get an immune system that doesn't know what to do. And this is where, when we, when we amplify this up over years, what we really are talking about is autoimmune disease and cancer, right? And so um, it's important to understand 
that autoimmune disease comes first in most cases. And autoimmune disease, the way I would like you to think about autoimmunity is it's pre-cancer, right? It's a form of pre-cancer where your immune system is basically on overload trying to deal with all these things that are going on, right? And then the process of this multiplied over years, you still get an abnormal cell line that manifests and turns into cancer. And so that's where the big dangers are, right? Because, you know, once you get cancer, it's, you know, if you go traditional, it's chemo, it's radiation, it's surgery. Most people that get cancer treatment don't die from their cancer. They die from the treatment of the cancer, which is quite preposterous when you really think about it. And same thing here with autoimmune disease. Most people, you know, with autoimmune disease, their immune systems are being suppressed with the heavy drugs that they're being put on. And those heavy drugs also contribute to cancer because they're immunosuppressive. And so again, it's kind of the same pathway. So you don't want to end up here. This is like the worst place to end up. So if you suspect mold is part of your issue, you've got to go backwards and you've got to look at, okay, several things. You've got to measure yourself. You've got to make sure that one, are you allergic to mold and are you surrounded by mold in your abode, in your home? Do you have mycotoxin poisoning? Um, beyond that, is that leading to opportunistic overgrowth of yeast, right? Creating the perfect trifecta for uh, a moldy yeast bomb in your body. And then secondarily, you've got to get your house checked out. And, and maybe it's not your house, but if you go to work every day and feel worse, or if you come home every day and feel worse after a long day of work, like pay attention. Those are clues. Those are insights into, you know, your environment might be poisoning you directly. And mold and mold toxins are, are no joke. They're super dangerous, and you do not want to be exposed to them over long periods of time. Okay, that's part one. We're going we're gonna to start with the, the questions. I love this question from Cheryl. Why don't all people have mold illness? So I'm going to I'm going to answer that by sharing some stories because I think it's important with with what what I typically see. This is and again, this is this is my world and this is my experience, but usually what I see and I'm going to be very generic here. Wife gets sick. From being sick, wife goes to doctors multiple doctors, right? Nobody's figured out why she's sick. She's been called crazy. She's been called um, depressed. Um, she's been told it's all in her head. So she gets sent to the shrink, right? So she tries the, you know, the antidepressants. And, um, and, and even some of the other medicines that are sometimes thrown out for a variety of different symptoms like fatigue and muscle pain and other things. And she doesn't get better and so she stays frustrated. And then she finds a doctor who actually does a deep investigation and they find a mold issue. Now, in this scenario, a lot of times the wife stays home. And the husband goes to work. So just in and of itself right there, husband's typically gone. He has 12 less hours of exposure if it's in the home, right? If the home is moldy, the husband has half the exposure on a, day, on a given daily basis of the level of, that the wife is, is exposed to. Again, there are variances within this. I know I'm, I'm generalizing here. You know, it does not say the wife only stays home and never leaves the house. But as a general rule of thumb, the husband goes to work nine to five, five days a week for the most part. And if he's a really hardworking guy, he's probably working 12 hour days or 14 hour days. And so he's gone a lot more and the wife stays in the environment. Now, I've seen cases where this, this was absolutely the truth and the wife gets so sick, right, that then the husband stays home to take care of her to take care of the wife, right? And then what happens to the husband? The husband starts to develop a mold issue. And I've seen this be the case a number of times where a husband didn't believe a wife until he stayed home to, to be a caretaker and started to get sick himself. So that's a variable, that's a factor certainly. Why is it then, so let's say that's not your variable. Let's say there are other variables. What are the other variables involved here? The biggest variable involved in, in whether or not somebody gets sick in mold is resiliency. And what is resiliency based on? It's based on your age, your diet, 
your behavior, your sun, you know, how much sunshine you get, how much exercise you get, whether or not you drink alcohol, right? Whether or not you take uh, illicit drugs. And that includes prescription drugs, folks. Those things don't make you healthy. If they made you healthier, you wouldn't, um, uh, if they made you healthier, you wouldn't need them forever, right? So age, diet, behavior, alcohol, drugs, sex. Generally, females are affected more than males. Males are generally more resistant. Uh, and so, you know, so mold, usually mold is a sexist type of, of illness, if, if we could call it that. But um, these are all variables. There certainly are more variables than this. But, uh, you know, for me, one of the things I see very commonly is, is the genetics as well. Now, you can't change or alter your genetics, but there are some genetic risk factors for mold exposure, some people. And guess what? Some of those genes are the same genes that make you susceptible to gluten. They're called HLA-DQ genes. And, and so some of the patterns, the HLA-DQ patterns, are also patterns that would increase your risk for reacting to mold or mold toxins in the environment. So there are all these different variabilities or variables that are taken into consideration. Um, another, you probably heard this, many of you probably heard this, the canary in the coal mines. So the canaries, the coal miners used to take canaries down into the mines because the poisonous gases that might bleach out or leach out of, of the rock, the, the canary would die first, right? The canary was the early warning sign to get the heck out of the mine because they couldn't, you can't smell the gas. So the canary is the one that reacts first before everyone else reacts. It's the canary is the person that warns all the other people, right? And so when somebody in the house is getting sick in this way, maybe they do have some of these variable factors, but sometimes people are the canaries for other people in the household. I know for me in my house, when, when we had mold, my wife got really sick. She was our canary. Um, but we were healthy enough going into it that we, it didn't take us years and years and years to recover like it, it, it does for some people. But she was our canary and she's the one um, who started pointing out certain things and then it all started making sense. So it's not that people aren't affected. I, in my opinion, I don't care who you are, Mycotoxins will poison you. So it's kind of like this. Mold, mycotoxins are poison to everyone, but not everybody's mold allergic, right? And depending on how long you get in mycotoxic exposure and how, what is the dose of exposure that you're getting, you know, and the resilience of the individual is to the, the distance at which it takes or the time at which it takes for you to become violently ill or very, very sick as a result of the, the chronic exposure. Okay. Let's see. Can mold be a trigger for eosinophilic esophagitis? Yes. So this is what I was talking about earlier, Mandy. Um, one of the hallmark symptoms of candidiasis is the EOE. It's where you have candida growing. And that, again, candida is yeast versus mold. Mold, think of mold as more external, something growing outside of you. Think of yeast more internal as, as a species of mold growing in you. And EOE is a uh, yeast overgrowth. Candidiasis is a common cause of EOE. It can also be a trigger for Hashimoto's. There have been a number of studies that show Remember, candida produces a hyphal wall protein that looks like gluten. We know gluten can emulate or can, can trigger Hashimoto's, but we also know that candida can as well. How do you get it out of your car? Depends on the extent and how in depth the mold is into your car, but one of the things that has been shown really well to, to, help, um, to help neutralize, so there's this, when you're trying, this is a whole nother show, but I'll give you just kind of a brief, and that's, if you're trying to neutralize mycotoxins, the number one rule is you've got to identify the mold and get rid of it. If you don't do that, it doesn't matter what you do. If the, if the source of the mold is not dealt with or addressed, then it will continue to push mycotoxins. There are things you can do to detoxify, there are things that you can do to neutralize mycotoxins, but unless you find the source of the mold, which generally means find the source of the excessive moisture, uh, because that's what mold needs. A mold needs moisture and it needs cellulose. It needs those two things and within 48 hours it can start propagating. So if you've got moisture and mold spores, which you've got mold spores, it's the chronicity of the moisture. So 
Where's that coming from in your car? That has to be found. Once you find that and deal with it, then you can address neutralizing the mycotoxins. And we'll talk more in a, in a later episode about how to do that, but um, you've got to find it first. Yeah, you've got to find where it's coming from. How often should your air ducts be cleaned in your home? You know, it depends on your home. Um, and it depends on, on the amount of debris and dust that your home generates. But a lot of that happens pre-construction, like the way they build homes today. They go in, everything's a dust ball flurry, and they put everything up as fast as possible. And when they're, ha they're not done building the home yet, but they're running your AC unit while there's still sheetrock dust and all kinds of nonsense in the air, and that's just pulling it right into your air duct. I've seen cases in new construction where there was enough debris in the air ducts a lot of people don't think that mold can grow in an air duct because it's metal typically, but what happens is all that debris and dust settles in the air duct and then that mold embeds in that debris and it can use a lot of that as food and it can, um, it can really create a problem. Let's see here. Ozone. Somebody mentioned ozone. You you can use ozone, but ozone's not 100% effective against mold. I, I would, it wouldn't be something. It wouldn't be my first choice for sure. Ozone, uh, as far as getting rid of mold. Can harmful mold be on food or grow on food not properly stored? It can. Um, the more your food sits out, the older, the more leftover eat your food is, there's a greater potential for mold to grow on it. Um, but where we really generally tend to see mold in food and mycotoxins in food, um, predominantly is in a handful of foods. And one is grains. This is one of the reasons why so many people with a mold problem, when they go grain-free, they, they see an immediate initial benefit. But grains... Another one is coffee, peanuts, and other um, uh, ground-based legumes. And then number four is, let's see, what am I missing here? Grains kind of, let's see, alcohol. Um, almost left my mind there, alcohol. Uh, is a big one because out, most alcohols are grain derivative, right? So a lot of your alcohols um, are taken from grains. And again, mold and mycotoxin and contamination of alcohols are is common, very, very common, especially your fermented types of alcohols like your beers, uh, your ciders, and some of the others that are fermented. Uh, there's another one, kombucha is another one I don't recommend people consume, although it's a popular health food drink. I don't, it's not something I really uh, recommend that people seek out, but these are some of your big ones, right? And even, um, you know, we could add this sugar. Sugar cane is oftentimes contaminated with mold and its byproduct, sugar. And so if you're avoiding a lot of these, which if you notice, a lot of these are part of the no grain, no pain, uh, avoidance of these is part of the no grain, no pain protocol. And there's a reason why. Remember, the book is not no gluten, uh, no pain. It's no grain, no pain. And mold and mycotoxins are one of the reasons why I write, uh, write about avoiding those foods in the book. Is there a test for Sears? No. Um, there's a battery of different types of tests that can help you identify whether or not it's most likely Sears, but there's not like a Sears test that you run um, specifically. Okay, um, let's see here. I used um, latex gloves and wore an N95 mask to clean the black mold. Is that good enough? Also rinsed hands with lemon and water a month passed with no symptoms. I mean, you're, you're okay. It doesn't sound like you've got a major, um, a major contamination exposure that made you sick. Some people do. I've seen cases where people were cleaning, trying to clean their own mold and got very, very sick. I wouldn't recommend an N95 and latex to try to to clean mold, I recommend a Tyvek suit and a respirator. I mean, that, that to me, if you want good protection, that's, that's where it's at. Can mold in the home end up on the food as they cook? Yes, it can, uh, especially the mycotoxins. They're circulating everywhere in the air once you've got a major contamination issue. Um, does it influence the telomeres or stem cells? Uh, mold inhibits DNA replication. So what is a telomere? The telomere is the end cap to your DNA. 
as far as stem cells, stem cells are produced as a result of, um, of DNA protein and RNA synthesis. So yes, it does. It affects all of those things. Um, how to increase energy levels to heal infection in the gut and raise hemoglobin. That's a pretty specific question. Um, I'd say start with no grain, no pain, Silvana. Start there. Um, start with diet if you haven't already. That's always the first place to start when, you, when you're struggling and you're chronically sick is diet first, diet and lifestyle. Is moving into a new house best? If so, scroll down. How do you overcome the chemicals from off-gassing from the new building material? Anything more than airing it out in purifiers? So moving into a new house is not always best. Um, it can be. It depends on the house that you're moving into and how it was constructed. So one of the, again, one of the problems in the construction industry is, um, you know, the, the problem with the success of the United States is that, is that look, I, I, I'm going to try not to, to offend anybody's um, heirs here today, but the reality is, you know, I, I'm not, a, I'm not, I am a fan of capitalism, but what I am not a fan of is taking people's money and yielding them or giving them something that's inferior or doing something to them that's inferior that might even harm them, right? Which I, I look at mainstream uh, hospitals and medicine as, as that, right? It's, it's, it's a money-based system where the care and the concern is, is really the backseat to the profits. That's not what capitalism is supposed to be. Capitalism with good ethics and good morals is a great thing. But in today's world, everything is all about the bottom dollar. And what happens is you get these big companies that have huge overhead that want to build things as quickly as they possibly can, paying the cheapest quantity of dollars and cheapest labor they can find. And so a lot of times they get unqualified, unskilled workers to do the work. And if that's what your new construction was built upon, then yes, you can create a major issue or you can move into a major, a new home and still have a major issue. It happened to me. It's, it's part of what happened when we, when we built a home. We, we, you know, within inside a couple of years, we had, um, you know, more than 100,000 spore counts of black mold growing in our wall. So it, it definitely, new construction is not necessarily the safest, but um, it's all about the construction industry. And as far as off-gassing, part two to that question, the best thing that you can do is, is, is try to let the house breathe. And so air, air purification with high, um, high efficiency HEPA, ultra fine HEPA air filters, probably one of the best things that you can do. Now, if you're extremely chemical sensitive, um, you might wait to move into a new home. I mean, depending on if you're trying to get out of mold into a new home, it's, it's a little bit different because you want to get out of that home as quickly as possible. But if you are um, if you're just trying to find a place and you have a little bit of time, you might wait to move into that home and let it outgas, you know, let it, let it outgas for a few months before you move right in. Are we sus more susceptible to get mold issues if we eat gluten and are sensitive to gluten? You know, you're more susceptible to have a worse reaction to mold because your immune system is battling gluten. And remember, your immune system also has to protect you from mold exposure as well. And so think of eating gluten if you're gluten sensitive as a distraction from your immune system being able to do its job with mold. A modern immunosuppressive for lupus, should I stop the infusion? I can't answer that question. That's really, that's a question you need to ask your doctor directly. Um, I had surgery to remove the mold in my sinus. I'm having an MRI to check my brain because I've had such a headache since the surgery on March 10th. So again, the immunosuppressive, that again, I would talk to your doctor about that. If you've got mold in your sinuses and you're on an immunosuppression drug, then your doctor should absolutely have access to that information so that the two of you can come to a, the best decision about what you need. Let's see. Keep going down. Oh, somebody asked, what did I do about the mold? I had, I had mold that was growing in one of my walls behind uh, an ice maker that was improperly connected. And we, we tore it all out and we remediated it. We sealed off that area, quarantined that area of the house, and we had a remediation team come out and, uh, and do the work. I, I don't recommend trying to clean your own mold. Uh, it's just, you know, unless you're a professional mold a remediator, I mean, I, I just don't recommend it. You know, there's, a, there's an art to every expertise. Unless you have that expertise, it, I'd say it's, a, it's a, something you should try to try to avoid doing. Is there any best test for new build 
I think Army is a good screening tool, Tiffany. Uh, the best test is before you invest all that money in buying a home is have a good mold investigator just come out and do decent thorough checkup um, because then you have a liability chain, right? When you've won, you have a liability. The, the thing about you know worrying about a new home and, 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 and everything is, is you want to create a liability chain with the builder. You want to create a liability chain with a mold inspector. And that way, if somebody missed it and your family ends up a year and a half inside a home and you're sick, there's a chain of liability where you showed beyond a reasonable doubt that your concern was mold and that you actually paid experts and professionals to come out and verify that, that the construction was okay and that there wasn't a mold issue. That's the best way that you can protect yourself is to create a liability chain if you're buying a new home. If you're buying a used home, there really isn't much protection uh, in that unless there's mold, pre-existing mold in the home and the, and the person selling you the home doesn't disclose that it's there. Uh, but a lot of times you, you buy a house and the owner didn't know it was there or there, there was no, no discernible, uh, discernible uh, mold that, that was identified when your inspector went through. So it, there's not, it's not a perfect scenario. And I know that's frustrating for a lot of you, but an ERMI is a great screening test. If I, if I were going to do an ERMI on a, te on a home that, that I was seeing built, I would want that ERMI score to be less than 2.5 or I would walk. And I know it's a crazy and it's a crazy market right now in terms of um, it's a crazy market in terms of real estate, but it's not worth moving into a place that makes you sick. Can mold cause low blood counts? It can. Mold can cause um, low red counts, low white counts, low platelets. Mold inhibits stem cell progenesis in your bone marrow, and this is one of the reasons why it's commonly linked to hematological disorders, disorders of of the blood if you will. And I see it on a, on, a, on a regular basis in folks where they've been to hematologists and their blood counts are low and they find the mold, right? And they get out of the mold and they see a rebound in their blood counts. Can an ozone machine like hotels used for smoke be used for seasonal house cleaning? Yeah, it, it can be used, but a problem with ozone, in, in my experience, in my opinion, is that if it's a preventative, you can do that. You just have to leave the house because ozone as a gas is toxic and dangerous to you if you're in there and it's dangerous to your pets. It's not something, obviously, you want to turn it on at high levels and stay in the home. And that's one of the problems with ozone is its toxicity level. And you've got to ramp it up high in order to be effective. But one of the best preventatives for mold, I, I like that question, is to use essential oil. There have been some really good, actually, research studies done in the industry that find that essential oils can be very, very effective, not so much at getting rid of mold. So first of all, don't try to treat your mold with essential oils. You, you treat the mold, you find the source of the mold, and you mitigate why it's there. So if it's water damage, you, you take care of that, you fix that, you make sure no more mold will grow. Then you can use strong, strong uh, doses of different types of essential oils, and you can aerate that or you can diffuse that through the home. And that mold, essential oils have actually been shown objectively to denature, degrade mycotoxins. They've also been shown to inhibit and be preventative for future mold growth. And so what are good ones? Frankincense and clove and cinnamon uh, and orange and other citrus oils all work really, really well. There's a, you know, I'm not, there's a particular brand that actually has had some studies done on it. It's, it's, um, it's a particular company, but they produce a product called Thieves Oil, and that product has been shown to be pretty effective. So I, I would tend to use something like that because it's non-toxic and there is an impact and a good effect versus, say, uh, an ozone machine that it is toxic, right? Now, ozone can be effective, but in my experience, it doesn't do the best job. Neither do those big mold bombs that they try to run through your house or through your AC units, those things I've seen so many times where people spent thousands of dollars doing that and it was just not effective. Um, UV sterilizers in the HVAC? No. Um, you're, if you have a UV sterilizer in your, in your ducts, understand that the air is just going through. It's just circulating through. So what happens is that air, you got a UV light installed in your, in your duct work and that air is just blowing right by it. There's no concentrated UV exposure that's occurring because that air just keeps circulating so that UV doesn't do much. Now where UV light is most effective is on the filter itself. So if you've got one of those thick filters like a MERV, uh, filter or you've got like a, a one of my favorites is IQ air. They're great. They make a great whole house air filter. It's it's shaped like a W 
and putting UV light on the filter because the filter captures mold and the UV light prevents the mold from propagating and growing. So you, you want to capture the mold, shine the filter or the light on the area that's being captured and not just have a UV light randomly placed in your air duct where, where there's not going to be much of an impact or an effect. Because you can spend hundreds of dollars on those UV lights and they don't, they don't do much unless they're aimed at the filter. What can you do for a fungal sinus problem? If it's, if it's fungus because you, you, you find out why it's growing first and foremost. So I mean, in my experience, when people have a fungal sinus problem, it's generally because they're immunosuppressed. Um, but there's some natural things. You can, one of the things you can do to help keep your sinuses healthy is use a neti pot with, uh, with just a neti pot with just the classic uh, salt water in the neti pot. You wanna use distilled water and, and use the, the, the salt, otherwise it'll dr really dry out your sinuses. But that can be a very effective and inexpensive way to keep your sinuses clear. If you have a problem with persistent you know, mold growing in your sinuses despite using a neti pot, then you've got an environmental mold issue that you need to get investigated. It's a, look guys, mold is, is one of those that no, it's like the thing that you, if, if you want to put your head in the sand about something, you, you want to put your head in the sand about mold because it's, when you find it in your house, I can promise you this, it's usually a big money cost. It's a huge, huge expense if you find it in a big way, especially if it's a construction defect because sometimes you're not just talking about remediating a small little area where there was some water damage. Sometimes it's, you know, you, you've got to remediate the whole house and you're talking about tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars. You, you know, you've got to get rid of old furnishing. You've got to throw out your mattresses and your pillows. You, they won't go in the wash and you can't wash it specifically. You've got to get rid of it. Many of the things, um, you know, you have to get rid of because they become contaminated, right? And if you're very, very sick and you're trying to make your way out of being chronically ill, you have to escape the contaminated environment and you don't, you, you know, that's where the struggle is for a lot of people when they're in mold. It's, it's, it's a death by a thousand cuts because when you're trying to get out of a moldy home, you, you've lost your favorite blanket, you've lost your favorite pictures, you've lost your mattress, you've lost your furniture. You know, you've, it's, it can be very, very, like I said, it can be very debilitating and stressful to do, but you know, you'll die in a moldy house. I, the, the very few things I've lost patients to over the years and mold toxicity has been one of those things. And that was, you know, one of the most, I could say succinct cases that I remember was a gentleman and we knew he had mold. We measured it. We measured it in every way you could measure it. We knew the house was contaminated. He refused to remediate it and um, he died. It took him about a year, but he got aspergillosis in his lungs, which is aspergillosis is a type of mold and it can colonize into the lung fields. And once it hits into the lung, there's about a 65% chance of death once it starts growing into the lung. And so he, he chose death over remediation. I, I don't, you know, I know that um, remediation can be daunting and an overwhelming process and task, but death is certainly, in my opinion, not the better of the two choices. So the, yeah, Lisa's asking, we did a mold kit from Lowe's and sent it off to the lab. It came back as mold growth, but no way to remedy it. How do we get rid of it? We taped the sample to our air vent. You got to figure out where it came from. It came from your air, but where, what part? I mean, is, is the mold growing in your ducts and that's why that colonized or do you have some other source? I mean, Lisa, the, the best answer there is to, again, is to get, excuse me, it's to get a good investigator out to do a thorough job, help you find it. So um, who's, uh, give me a name on that question there. Uh, Robbie, um, she found several species of mold. Um, I don't know how those tests were done, Robbie, first of all, so it's hard for me to give you any kind of um, feedback there. But if you're taking glutathione injections weekly to try to help detoxify from mold, but you're still in mold, it isn't gonna work. You're wasting your money. Um, the number one rule of mold detoxification is get out of the mold. If you're not out of the mold, there's no point in trying to detoxify. You're just throwing your money away. Um, so I, I don't know where you, where, you, um, where you are with that, but you've got to get the mold under control. You've got to remediate whatever's there because if you're in a moldy environment, no amount of detoxification is going to do the trick. Hmm. 
Let's see. How long do you think it will be to detox mold? Uh, you know, it varies for different people, but the biggest variable in my experience is the time they were in the mold and how and the and the the level of illness, the level of illness that they currently are. So the level of resiliency, if you will, either lack of resiliency, which is illness or 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 um, or their ability to resiliently recover. Because if you are chronically ill, it can take, you know, I've seen, I've seen mycotoxins take, you know, a year, in some cases longer to come out of a person fully through detoxification. So um, it just depends. And again, a big part of that depends is the environment that you're in. Okay, let's see here. Go down on the right for me. Okay, a lot of comments here. Um, are there any home tests or body tests that measure other pathogens and biotoxins? Uh, there are lots of them. I don't think you want to get wrapped up in that um, unless you plan on becoming an expert and, and you're you know, dealing one-on-one -on -one directly with people. Um, if you, you, know, you really only need one point, in my opinion, you only need to lay in one point of evidence to know that you have a mold problem, and that's measuring mycotoxins. If you measure mycotoxins and they're positive, you have a mold problem. Now, is the mold problem in your food or is the mold problem in your home or your, your office? That's where the differentiation needs to come. But, you know, that, that's the number one thing that you need to look at and measure as far as like biofilms or biotoxins. There, yeah, you could rack up a huge lab bill looking at all those other things, but it might not tell you why they're there. It might just tell you that they're there. Whereas at least knowing that if you have mycotoxins, now you have definitive action steps that you can take to go and now hunt down the source. If you have a mold overgrowth in your body, is eating mushrooms out of the question? No, but certain mushrooms, uh, because certain mushrooms are actually immuno, um, th they help your immune system like lion's mane would be an example of an immune supporting mushroom. There are a number of species of healthy mushrooms that you can eat, but as a general rule of thumb, um, you know, I, my advice would be if you're in mold and you have mold toxicity issue, you should be working with somebody. This is in my you know, like mold is not a DIY project. It's just not. Um, you know, if you try to do it on your own, I, look, I've just seen people spend. You know, I had I had a woman not too long ago. It was you know what it was a fifty grand on just because she didn't have guidance, right? And not not that not that. Um, so like a perfect example would be you hire a, a mold inspector and then depending on which state that you live in, like in some states, it's legal for the mold inspector to also be a mold remediator. So you get the same person that's saying you have mold is the same person who's going to clean your mold. That's a conflict of interest. You don't, you don't want that conflict of interest in somebody doing that level of work for you at that level of cost without any oversight because who's going to check their work? And that's, that's just one example of, of, of a thousand examples I could give you on, on a huge mistake that can be made that can, that can keep you sick and keep you from, from getting well, but also keep you broke. Um, because again, it, it can get expensive. Does mold toxicity cause or affect exercise resistance? It, it, mold toxicity oftentimes leads to the inability to tolerate exercise. So what ends up happening is people are so inflamed they don't do well with exercise. Exercise is like the, the tipping point for their health. And so then they lose their ability to be physical in the world and that deteriorates their muscle mass and then that weakens their immune system further and the mold just slowly eats away. 
How does one find if they have a water leak upstairs? Um, lots of ways. You can do infrared. Uh, infrared temperature variances in the wall sometimes will show you where there's a potential for a water leak. You can do um, fiber optic cameras. You can do mold me uh, moisture meters, you know, in the sheetrock and around the wall basins to see. Uh, lots of different ways. Yeah, I, 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 I hate to hear that, Rose. Rose says we're... Um, we gutted the house. It cost a million. We had sewage in the ducts, uh, mold and dead animals. Yeah, that sounds like a major problem. I, I'm sorry you had to go through that. I know it, it's it's a rough deal. Let's see here. So I'm I'm I'm. I have a question. Uh, this is from Ocean Healer. I had a question. Um, some dry clean only clothes were stored in suitcases in the garage for two years. Can we steam them at home? They smell musty and I had uh, a mold condition. No, those clothes are toast. Get rid of them. They're not worth the risk. And I hate to say that because I know clothes can be expensive, but you know, your health not, not doing well can be more expensive in, in, not, in more ways than just financially. If you smell must, that's mycotoxin and mold. If you smell it, you don't have to see it. If you smell it, it's there. That was one of the things in my house. We could smell must. We couldn't see it anywhere. And it wasn't until we cracked the wall cavity um, that it really poured out. And that's, you know, again, it, but not seeing it, but smelling it was still enough to make us sick. But um, we left everything behind. When I, when I got out of mold, we left it all behind. Um, you know, it's painful to do that, but... You know, you got to weigh your material value in this world with your health. And to me, that's a zero competition game. Your, your health is the most important thing you have. Your health is your wealth. Um, and, and so, you, you know, you've got to preserve that first and foremost. Does I don't kill mold in your sinus? There is no mold in my house. Um, iodine is an antifungal and antibacterial naturally. Um, the question isn't, does it kill it? The question is, will it kill it in your case, right? And this is where, um, probably by itself, no, I would, I would be suspect that that would be an effective way. One of the things that you should probably do is have a culture of your sinuses done. And then if you find, you know, if you culture the mold, then you can subject, have your doctor subject that culture to different agents to see what will best kill the mold that's growing in you. That's probably the best way to go about it. Yeah, I mean, Joanne's asking, what kind of doctor should I find? A functional one. I mean, you, the problem in conventional is you're going to find a bunch of people that call you crazy. Um, the same thing with conventional mold inspectors. You're going to find mold inspectors that think you're, you're being an alarmist. Uh, mold is no joke. You've got to find somebody who knows what the heck they're doing, who can help you, who's got good experience, who's not going to um, minimize the potential possibility that mold can make you very sick. Uh, let's see. Keep going down. Do I have a duct cleaning company that I recommend? No, no, I, I, I don't. If the ducts are that bad that you suspect there's mold in them, then they replace the ducts. I know that's, that can be expensive too, but if, you know, what happens a lot of times is when you have, when you have debris, you know, s stored up in your, in your ducts and there's mold in that and you get somebody to to scour that duct work, what you're really doing is stirring all that stuff up and you're blowing it right back into your air. Cleaning air ducts, if they're bad and they really need a, a, a scouring, you, you, should, you, know, you should look at the cost of replacement versus the cost of cleaning. And no amount of, of um, in my experience anyway, no amount of, of fumigating the ducts is going to be successful. The most successful thing I've seen is fumigating duct work with essential oil. Um, that has, I have seen be successful, but a lot of these mold killers, not so much, at least these like heavy industrial mold agents that are commonly used. 
Okay, I think I got to go home. It's 730. I, we took this a little bit uh, longer than usual. So um, look, I hope you walk away at least with something beneficial tonight. And um, if you suspect mold again, number one, walk away is work with somebody who's an expert who understands uh, who really understands mold and mold poisoning and mold toxic toxicity. Uh, otherwise, you're going to be, you're going to, you're going to have your illness normalized. You're going to be the one that's, that's called crazy for all intents and purposes. And it's, it's a, just a rough road and it's a hell of a struggle. And I don't want to see that for any of you going through that. So um, work with somebody who's an expert. It's, you know, you can do diet. Sometimes you can get away with the do it yourself project with diet, you know, and, and, and find a, a pathway forward. But when you're talking about mold, you definitely don't want to, don't want to go it without, without guidance. All right, folks, I hope you have a fantastic week. We'll see you next Monday for another episode of Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain. Hey, if you're not subscribed to my newsletter and you don't want to get censored or you don't want my information to be censored from getting into your inbox, come over to glutenfreesociety.org and make sure you sign up. It's free. We'll send you a bunch of, a ton of free information. We'll get you access to all of our past shows and everything else. Um, just make sure you're on our newsletter, on our email list. It's the only way that we can really guarantee the lack of censorship. And you know, as you know, we've, we've had our fair share of it over the past two years. So have a fantastic week. We'll see you next Monday for another episode. Take care. Hey, don't forget to tune in next week, same time, 6 p.m. Central Standard Time for another Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain Show. Bring all your toughest health questions to me. I look forward to answering them. And before you leave today, make sure you hit subscribe. And once you do, click that bell. That bell is going to allow us to remind you right before we go live. But it's also going to allow us to remind you when we come out with other video content all week long. We've got lots of episodes coming your way all week long and I don't want you to miss anything. So again, subscribe, hit that bell so that you can get notified when we have that new information put up for you. Thanks so much and I'm wishing you excellent health. Have a great week. We'll see you next Monday night.